Thank you so much. Um, pleasure to be here. Obviously, this is Threat Modeling 101. Uh, we'll be covering threat modeling, attack, defend, security, convenience, spectrum. And those are all really, really massive topics. So this is a high level talk. Uh, first and foremost, I respect your time. If we start getting into this and you say you want to go deeper, feel free to head out, go check out some vendors, explore another talk. Remember, your time is valuable, so make sure you're in the right spot. Secondly, we all just ate lunch. If you just need some nice, soft voice to help you fall asleep, I will not be offended. Close your eyes, have a great nap, enjoy the time away from work. So, all that being said, ignore that. No sleeping in this <laughs> talk. <laughs> All that being said, my name is Steve Grant. My pronouns are he and him. Um, for work, I am a senior engineering manager and product owner at Fifth Season. Um, I'll break each of those down, starting with Fifth Season. So we're based here out of Pittsburgh. We are a controlled environment, agriculture, vertical indoor farm. Really a, a lot of cool buzzwords. Basically, we're just robot farmers. Uh, we use technology to do all of our decision making, and we produce a million pounds of leafy greens right out of Braddock, uh, right next to a steel mill. So go to Giant Eagle, check it out. It's cool stuff. Um, the other part, I'm a senior manager and a product owner. And normally, we see that as two different things, right? Our, our product owners say, here's what we need to do. Go figure it out. And then our engineering managers say, OK, great. Here's how we're going to accomplish it. Well, when I have to wear both of those hats at the same time, it really makes me think of, OK, what's important to the business? How can we, as a team, do this and do this right without having the technical debt in the future? So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is kind of driven from that perspective of four leaders, four product owners, four managers, and people that are just generally new to security. How do we get involved with some of these concepts? Um, I don't have a lot of social, but please hit me up on LinkedIn. I had some QR codes here that aren't working, but if you want to copy this slide deck, just send me a message, um, as well as my manager README. I think it'd be awesome if all managers came with README files. And so there's a site called Manager ManagerReadMe, um, where you can go and, and check out um, myself and encourage your managers and other people in your leadership to write their own README files. Outside of that, I'm a big CI/CD junkie, grew up and cut my teeth on the DevOps, this admin side of life, but huge board game player. If anyone wants to play some Magic later, hit me up. Uh, always looking for a good fish taco, so if you've got a good recipe, send that my way as well. So breaking all that down, our little dash dash help. As I said, I'm not a cybersecurity engineer. I'm focusing on the business, helping the business get the goals that they need to do better work. A lot of people here might be in that same boat, a lot of people aren't. But at the end of the day, we're all just trying to have good, secure systems, right? And there's 100,000 different ways that we can accomplish that goal. So with some of my backgrounds in systems engineering and other tools, um, I'm focused now on bringing this to the forefront, like I've said, convincing other people in leadership that these are the things we need to be pursuing, and these are the roads that we need to go down. And the first and foremost step in doing that is having these kinds of threat models. And some of the tools to help understand our threat models are going to be this MITRE attack and defend framework. All right, introductions out of the way. Heads up, let's go. Why is security important? Relevant XKCD, right? Every architecture, every infrastructure that we have is going to be composed of thousands and thousands and thousands of other little pieces. How many people here have written all those pieces yourself? Absolutely no one, right? Even if you go down and you write your full application, you're probably writing it on someone else's operating system, or you're probably using hardware you did not assemble. Unless you're printing your own silicon chips, like we're relying on other people in the community, in the culture, to help with the security, right? So we need to trust and understand that nothing that we have uh, is fully in our control. So we need to be prepared for some of this. And so then when we might be asking, all right, cool, why is that important? Really simple. This is my favorite uh, clip art that I found out on the internet. Just a happy guy holding money, right? Why is security important? Why do we care? The technology industry is ridiculous. 65% of global, global GDP is technology driven. People in our field, people in the technology space, we are at the forefront of the money that's going and driving the world forward. And when technology and security events happen, those things fall apart. So of course, businesses are going to say, yes, we need to invest in security. Uh, we need to do these things. And it's our job to help explain it to a lot of these people. So what is threat modeling, right? You hear this, I've heard this talk like 
or mentioned a couple times already in just various talks that we've had. Um, is it some crazy, ridiculous thing? Not really. It can be. Really boils down to three questions. What are we talking about? Where can it go wrong? And then what are you going to do about it? So it's, it's really simple when you think of it in a nice, easy sentence. X poses a risk to Y, so I'm going to do Z. We are all humans. We have evolved to just kind of inherently have this notion and understanding of things. Um, uh, you know, I'm worried about falling down the stairs, so I'm going to hold the handrail. Or maybe I shouldn't have drinks with my neighbors the night before I go speak at B-Sides, because then I might do a poor job on my performance. Irrelevant, I just said. So let's think through this and with kind of this easy mode notion, right? Doors, just login services for our houses. That's all they are. Everyone knows doors. We've all used them. So let's think of this scope. What is the door? We want to focus on that one item. They allow this ingress, egress for this house. They're composed of glass, wood, aluminum, what other materials make them up. OK, we know our scope. We understand what we're talking about. We've kind of reduced this down. What are some threats that we have here, right? Lock picks. Everyone's hopefully checked out the lock picking village. You picked up a tool or trick or something. And now you can go and pick locks. You are now a threat to all the other house login services in the world. Congratulations. Um, Smart lock hackers, right? Smart locks are being pretty popular. You connect them with your home IoT system, and now someone on the other side of the world could invade your Wi-Fi and unlock your door for you for someone else to come in. Or you know what? If this Google picture that I found is your house, I would say a large rock is a very strong threat to your door. And so it's thinking about all these things, right? What are the, the things? Um, if you have a child or anyone else, you yourself are a forgetful human. Failure to use the service correctly is also a big threat. Um, so we have this notion of, all right, we know the things that can go wrong. We know what we're talking about. What are you going to do about it? So the final step in any kind of a threat model is to mitigate the risks. Uh, motion alarms are great for a sliding door like this. Um, if you want to get really crazy, you know what? Hire guards with dogs and you know, set up a massive security system around your house. It's probably not practical for most people. But you know what? If this was my door, I might just take an old broom handle and shove it down in the corner because that will work 98% of the time. See Exhibit A, Large Rocks. Um, so it's, it's, again, just this notion. And we do this all the time, as I said. This is very intrinsic to us of how threat modeling approaches. But when we start thinking about software and technology, this is really where we need to start being a little bit more specific. So this example is taken straight from the OWASP website. They do a great breakdown of the threat modeling process. And they run through it with this college library website, right? Really think basic example. Staff students can log in, librarians can add books, remove books, add users, et cetera, right? Like real simple, basic kind of application. So as we start thinking about this, you know, number one, assessing our scope, where do we want to draw the lines, right? All these systems and subsystems and subsystems of those systems are interconnected. For the purpose of our specific threat model that we're talking about, what do we care about? Because you could go down the rabbit hole and start getting into the bare metal that's hosting your college library website. So really understand who do you want to trust and what do you want to control. And there has to be a level of trust of your subsystems or of these other black boxes that you're just blindly accepting the output from them as your input. So figure out whether you're zooming in or zooming out and whether you want to just say, you know what, we trust our systems engineers. We've done our research on our vendors and our third party. We understand that they're going to do a good job protecting their systems. Let's just focus on the stuff that we are writing in-house. Or you could say, you know what, we're doing a deep dive into every tool. We're only using open source software that we understand and going down that road. So first steps going through assessing scope. Probably, I would say, the most important part of figuring out what you're actually talking about, just draw it out. Remember, I'm a manager. I left technology, and I lost any intelligence that I had. I need nice pictures. Anyone in your leadership will appreciate a nice picture. So we can look at these kind of things, and we can already see, all right, we've got a lot of points of contact, a lot of data flow, where we're storing a lot of this information. Um, what are some of these external dependencies that we care about? Where are we drawing those trust borders and saying, we will allow these things to come in versus not? 
What are these exit points, which are just as important as entry points? If a hacker can get into your system but can't really do anything with the information, you have some level of coverage there. Um, and again, just reestablishing the, the trust levels. So looking at this, if we're thinking about this library example, uh, where do we want to start? Our scope is assessed. Let's think through those three questions. Here's what we're talking about. What can go wrong with it? And that's where MITRE ATT&CK really comes into play. So this is massive. I'm sorry anyone in the back. Like You go to attack.mitre.org, and this is what you see. This is a little overwhelming, especially if you're sitting in the back of the room and it's all just blurry to you. So what are we actually looking at here? Real simple. It's a user base or knowledge base of everything that can go wrong, right? Played a lot of Street Fighter 2. I would always get my butt beat and I would say, all right, I know that move. I recognize that. That's that Hadouken. I'm used to that thing hitting me in the face. I don't know how they do it. Well, this is what MITRE ATT&CK is, right? It says, here's all the things that can hit you in the face, and then here's how they're done. So it's this massive, massive library of all these different things that we can utilize to understand how someone might try to impact our system. So if you drill into this, there's 191 techniques, and those techniques break down further into 386 different sub-techniques. And so again, that is a lot of information, right? If you're starting your security program, if you're trying to figure out which direction to take your team, what do you, you just throw a dart at this board? It's like, no, there's other good information out there. And we gotta think who or what is most likely gonna impact our system. What is the best use case? If we've got a limited amount of time, how do we approach this? So thinking about this, some of our first places, you know, database files comes up. How do we secure our database? Um, we've got the SQL queries reaching out. We've got the different user groups, um, and then those calls going through. And this is a limited example. Obviously, we would have had this mapped out a lot deeper with the technologies and tools available, but it's quite obvious when you start thinking about it. It's us. We're the baddies. We're the bad people. Us being humans interacting with your system. I don't care how secure your system is, there's probably a username or password that breaks it pretty quickly. Um, I love this. This comes from the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report. Again, another fantastic read. They publish that every year. Definitely check it out. 82% of breaches involve the human element, right? Look at this graph. Is it easier to create a zero day and create some exploitive vulnerability or just steal someone's credentials? Like the, these are really easy concepts. So we say, okay, if we know our users are probably the weak link in the system, let's keep that frame of mind and go into this MITRE ATT&CK framework. So once you start diving into some of this, um, you can really poke into things. So you dive into that big MITRE chart, you scroll down, you find something that kind of relates to what you're talking about, and we come here. Oh, credentials from password stores. Okay, again, dumb manager hat. Let me read what some of this is. Uh, people steal your local password stores. Okay, I understand what that attack vector looks like. But with these and a couple of the other ones, let's dive into some of these sub-techniques to really understand what's going on. Uh, credentials from web browsers, we're all using web browsers. What does this look like? And again, MITRE ATT&CK just really dives deep into a lot of this. Uh, for those in the back that can't see this, if you're on a Windows system using Google Chrome, here's how you get the database file from that system. Here's the SQL you can use to extract that information, and here's the API function to decrypt that. And all this information and all these attack patterns are right there at your fingertips if you're running through that attack system. And what's really great about attack is it breaks all these down into these four main areas. So one, understanding what the attack is and how it works. Again, the manager, give me nice simple words, let me understand a lot of these things. Browser store passwords, so they must store them somewhere, right? Thank you. Procedure examples. As we said, we're getting used to hitting the, or we're used to getting hit in the face with those Hadoukens. Who's doing that? Well, we've got Silver Terrier using Agent Tesla, and they try it roughly 17,000 times a month, and they yield almost 1,000 successful exploits. These are references to different NSA papers, different government papers, other things that are coming out from analysts saying, hey, here's an attack we saw, here's how they did it, 
And then MITRE ATT&CK is taking all that information and building it out into that framework so we're all using the same language. So when we start thinking about mitigations, ATT&CK leads us down some good rabbit holes of things that we can do to work with some of these mitigations. And remember, that's our third question in our threat model of, you know, what are we talking about? How is it going to get broken? And what are we going to do about it? Um, and ATT&CK, again, presents that in a nice way so you can say, here's how I can mitigate it. Here's how I can detect it. But let's go a step deeper. Let's jump into MITRE's DEFEND. So a lot of people have probably heard of MITRE ATT&CK. Um, MITRE DEFEND went under the radar because it came out mid-2021. We're still in COVID craziness. We're not going to conferences. Uh, Might have you know, just completely missed your radar. But defend.mitre.org, they use the LEAT 3 on DEFEND, just as a point of note. Keep that in mind, because we're hackers, right? You got to. Um, <laughs> So MITRE DEFEND is really interesting because these are just fully interactive websites. So if we go in and look at these artifacts that we have here in the middle, we can start, well, I guess let me say, to break this one down further, this is your rock, paper, scissors map, right? If MITRE ATT&CK is saying, here's all the bad things that can happen, here's how they do it, MITRE DEFEND is saying, here's what beats what. Obviously, both coming from MITRE, spoiler alert, there's going to be some connections between the two. So that being said, we can start using for some of these artifacts, right? We're concerned about our users and specifically our user accounts. So we can just go to defend, search user account, and boom, great. More information for people that are trying to figure this out for the first time, making sure we're all talking about the same thing. And then what's great about uh, defend is we're seeing where some of these other pieces are that might relate to this puzzle. So if you're exploring this road for the first time, you could say I'm interested in user accounts. Okay, what composes user accounts? What goes into it? And then you get these wonderful charts showing other things that contribute to it. Diving further into this, and again, this is all on the site, um, you start seeing related countermeasure techniques and related offensive techniques. So all these red ones are attack vectors. So if we go back to MITRE ATT&CK, we could find each of these listed in that massive, massive chart somewhere and how the action impacts the artifact itself. Similarly, we have all these related countermeasures that we can use to prevent some of these things. And so maybe we have a strong password policy that strengthens our user account or maybe biometrics for authentication or multi-factor authentication, right? Multi-factor is huge. We should all be doing that. So if we dive into multi-factor, hey, great. Defend again says, here's all the different attack vectors that multi-factor authentication is going to help you out with. So as we're building these models, we can start to determine where do we get the best bang for our buck? Which of these tools is going to help us out? And so just going looking at multi-factor, we've got this list of different ways that we can stop whatever that attack vector is that we're interested in. So the fun thing is, is you can make this into any kind of training activity if you want, right? What attack vector is hidden here? And start working on this with some of your team. You know, what things could access your keyboard input device but could be isolated or detected using IO port restriction? Um, ah, key login. And then some of these maps are pretty complicated when you start mapping out the ways all these different things can interact together. So, you know, what are something that's accessing credentials and trying to access command history logs, right? Hey, look, our bash history. This is a real thing. Hackers get into your system and they can just go and see your bash, bash history files. And some of these defend techniques are ways that we can prevent that and slow things down. So, Great, we are all happy. We now have this wonderful threat model. We understand what we're talking about, how things can occur, and what we can do about them, right? Bring this back to work and you're now famous. Not quite yet. Because behind all of this, behind every one of these companies, is this notion of business value. <laughs> And we all love cybersecurity, right? That's why we're here. We think security is really important. We think it's cool. We think it's where we should put all of our money in. But ask your boss, what is more important, that your email server stays up or that you have a strong cybersecurity problem? And more times out of not, they'll probably say, we need email for business functionality. And so when we start thinking about these, it's like, 
how do we do this? How do we sell this? Because it's always ROI, right? Everything is about ROI when it comes to businesses. Remember, 65% of global GDP. There's a lot of money on the table when we're talking about cybersecurity. And some of this is really, really hard to present and say this is why it's important. Um, and some of these security practices are a real pain. And some of them are terrible for users. Some of them are terrible for engineers. Some of them are terrible for leadership who has to pay for some of this. And so organizations will treat our cybersecurity like any other kind of operational expense, prioritize it based off of that return on investment. So one of the things in our jobs, as we're building out these threat models using the MITRE tools and technology, is to understand what that ROI impact is. And really understand this notion of the secure side versus the convenience side. I don't know how many of you were in the privacy talk earlier, but there's a lot of really cool things that we can do to be super, super secure. Guess what? It's a real pain in the ass. And it works, sure. But again, you've got a lot of hoops you've got to jump through in order to make that happen. And someone has to use that convenience. And so it really depends on where you want to break that cost down. Who's going to pay that cost and what does that actually look like? Is it just you know, requiring re-authentication and multi-factor every single call your application makes? Well, then your users are going to eat that cost and they're likely going to hate it and want nothing to do with it. Is it just a really cool out-of-the-box application that you want to buy? Great. Your leadership has to pour their money into it. Is it something we're going to write in-house, something we're going to maintain, build, and work on? Awesome. That's engineering time that's going into all these things. And so like any good Scrum Agile practitioner, we get to point things. We can size things, however you want to call it. If we look at these different efforts and these different actions that we can take, we can explore these different levels of effort, whether it's a complexity thing, whether it's an exertion thing, uh, a risk to your current systems, or different resources that it is. And each of these will map somewhere to a different cost that someone has to pay. And that could be your OpEx, that could be your CapEx, your customer support cost, or even just your customer experience, right? If your system sucks to use, you're going to lose customers, that's going to lose business, and leadership's not going to be happy. And so we look at, you know, thinking back to our library example, let's think, you know, we have our users, we know multi-factor authentication is a good way to do this. How do we approach this? Our library is on Google Suite, you know, 90% of the world is on Google Suite or Office 365. For Google Suite, hey, I want to enforce two-step verification. That's it. It's a checkbox. It's included out of the box, right? If you're using Google Suites and you don't have multi-factor authentication enabled, you're doing something wrong, because it's literally one button click. Sure, you might have some experience with your users that have to re-authenticate the first time, or if they lose their cookies or change their device, having to re-authenticate with multi-factor. And that's where some of that cost comes into play. And then you go through these exercises, and you can write these little blurbs and say, for this threat model, we think users are a big thing that we need to worry about. Here's all the attack vectors that can happen with compromised credentials. Here's a solution that we think will work. It's low complexity, low exertion, mild risk in case you have a service that's using this that would need to get re-authenticated. Um, but our resource implementation is really minimal. So when you think of that on that spectrum, it's a high level of security with a fairly low cost and therefore uh, a high convenience factor as well. So multi-factor, again, I can't say this enough. Users are bad. Multi-factor is good. So. The, the final part here is, is the security worth it, right? You know, we have to think sanely about security. What is within your realm of control? What are you willing to risk, right? Are you worried about ninjas beating you up in the street? Probably not. If a ninja approached me in the street, I'm done. But I'm not, you know, that's not an active part of my mental threat model in everyday life. Snakes are a common fear for a lot of people. Snakes on a plane, maybe even for some. But how many people are afraid of cars, right? What is more likely to injure you, a snake or a car? So think about these kinds of things, you know, where your fears are set, where your threat model is based. And then avoid going down these dark alleys. If I know there's ninjas and snakes down this alley, I'm not going to go there. Should I allow my users to click links that get sent to them? Should I allow them to install their own software? Choose in your model what level of trust you want to have, what capabilities you give to your users. 
and the, the final part here is, you know, think more broadly, right? I'm not so focused on one specific type of snake that I'm going to miss everything else. I, heck, reptiles in general. Let me just focus on what do I do if I get poisoned, right? Seems like a fair response. Have these broader scenarios, these broader playbooks incorporated in your threat model so that way you can understand and you're not lost down the weeds too much. And all this is great, right? We come to this conference, we learn all this. This is all just wonderful theory. None of it means anything in cybersecurity unless we actually do something with it. Each of these areas that I've talked about could use their own deep dive. You know, portions, every slide here could probably be its own talk as you go down these rabbit holes, especially with MITRE attack and defend. Um, so I'm going pretty quick, so I want to take some time after this and kind of poke around attack and defend, show you what that looks like. And I strongly encourage you to do the same. These are open source projects. They are free tools to use. Save them, show them to your leadership, show them to your team, and that way we can all start speaking the same language. And then additionally, as you're thinking about this, and it's one of those things, once you see it, you can't unsee it, you'll start thinking about personal threat models in your personal life, in your personal security, and then that's where you start building those memories and bring those to your corporate security. Uh, atomic habits, aggregation of marginal gains. Again, what are your small things you can do that can have big impacts? Preda principle, focus on the vital few. Make those changes iterate. Make those changes iterate. Do what works, and by the end, you've got all these different security measures encompassing broad spectrums of different ways to prevent you from being infiltrated. Defense in depth is a goal, but you have to start somewhere. That somewhere, of course, is users. Um, and remember, you're not alone on this journey, right? We're all here at B-Sides. We're all friends. So next year, I want to see someone up here diving into one of these techniques. Come give a talk at B-Sides. It's not scary, I promise you. Um, but get involved, get to meetups. Understand what the uh, industry is doing. Subscribe to newsletters. Follow different YouTube channels. See what's going on there so that way you can stay fluent with it. Because we're all in this together. I'd say 65% of the world is in this together as we navigate these cybersecurity roads. There's a lot of good information out there. Final TLDR, threat modeling, really simple. X poses a risk to Y, so I'm going to do Z. At the highest level, it's your choice on how deep you want to get into that. Play around with attack and defend, and then prioritize your biggest bang for your buck. You've heard me harboring credential hardening, but then you dive into these matrices and got plenty of time to do that here. So let's go ahead and jump over to that. So if I go to the um, MITRE Defense site, this is it. Uh, as I said, defend.mitre.org. All these nodes are active. These are different areas that we can jump in. So you've heard me harping on credential hardening. Let's just click credential hardening. These are those things that we were just talking about, all the different sub-techniques. By activating credential hardening, these are all the different artifacts that we're going to be able to start securing. So you can dive down into each of those ones, and hey, look, here's all the related attack techniques that we now have coverage for. And so if we want to jump around and poke around with some of these, we definitely can do that. Um, if we look at credential accessing, um, OS credential dumping, we can search these up. OS credential dumping. I will add, this is constantly under work from the team at MITRE. So as they're rolling out new features, read their release notes. Maybe that link was supposed to work and it didn't. I don't know. But I could jump over here to credential hardening. And that gives me a lot of these inferred relationships that we were just talking about. Look at all this stuff that comes in, what an OS credential hardening or OS credential dumping attack can do, the different artifacts that that level of effort can hit. So again, strongly, strongly encourage, go through these, poke around. There's a lot to see here. Multi-factor authentication, these were the screenshots that I was showing earlier. The attack website, attack.mitre.org, same thing. We've got all this ridiculous amount of information here. So if we wanted to dive into those credentials from password stores, here it is. Oh, hey, look, here's that agent Tesla that we were just talking about. Here's all the references to different papers. Um, here's the reference paper from Fortinet of that group out of Nigeria and attack matrices that they used. 
So all that information is linkable through that attack framework. You're able to dive into it and, and explore it around. So again, strongly, strongly encourage that. Dive deep into these. These tools are phenomenal. So keep that one at a tight 30. We don't need to go the whole 45. But thank you for the time. Um, hopefully you learned something. If anyone has questions, I will try my best to answer them. Thank you.